All right, section 12.4 and 12.5 are our last sections of this chapter, but section 12.4 is uh, quite in depth. As we focus on the special senses, our objectives include, our, uh, include to explain the relationship between the sense of smell and taste, describe how the sensations of smell Practice and at this time. to describe how the sensations of smell and taste are produced and interpreted, name the parts of the ear and explain the function of each part, distinguish between static and dynamic equilibrium, describe the roles of the accessory organs to the eye, name the parts of the eye and explain the function of each part, explain how the eye refracts light, explain how the brain perceives depth and distance, and lastly, uh, describe the visual nerve pathway in the uh, uh, eye. So describe the visual nerve pathway. So special senses. Special senses are the senses whose sensory receptors are located in large complex organs in the head. And you have the five special senses that include smell uh, in olfactory organs. Uh, you have taste in taste buds. You have hearing and equilibrium in the ears. And then you have uh, sight, which occurs in the eyes. So let's look at the sense of smell. The sense of smell is olfaction. And olfactory receptors are chemoreceptors, and the chemoreceptors are located in the upper nasal cavity. Chemoreceptors themselves are, are a sensitive portion is cilia-like dendrites on bipolar neurons. Uh, the chemicals must be dissolved in solution to be detected and they must undergo rapid sensory, sensory adaptation. You also have uh, olfactory organs, and olfactory organs uh, are things such as the olfactory equal, uh, epithelium in the upper nasal cavity of the nose, and this would be on the superior nasal concha. So here you can see the olfactory bulb and the olfactory nerve. Here you can see olfactory muco uh, muco mucosa histology. So below there you have supporting cells and Bowman's mucus glands. Here you can see the olfactory receptors themselves. So here are the cilia, olfactory receptor cells, the columnar epithelial cells. There's the cribriform plate, the olfactory bulb. So as far as olfactory nerve pathways, in olfactory nerve pathways, you have a primary and a secondary neuron. The primary neuron is the olfactory receptor cell. And the olfactory receptor cell the axons are going to pass through the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone and the synapse in the olfactory bulb. And then that's going to lead to the secondary neuron in the olfactory bulb, which leads to cranial nerve 1. And there the axon reaches to the cerebral cortex, but it does not pass through the thalamus. So you can see uh, there you have the olfactory nerves to olfactory bulbs to olfactory tracts, the limbic system for emotions, and olfactory cortex for interpretation. So here you can see the olfactory tract, the olfactory bulb highlighted, olfactory nerves, and the olfactory mucosa. Olfactory stimulation, uh, theory is smell stimulates many receptors. You have a certain combination of, uh, that would equal specific smells Sometimes sniffing is needed to bring uh, odorant molecules up to the olfactory equilibrium. So we say that the sense of smell drops by 50% within a second after stimulation. Olfactory receptors are continually being replaced 
by stem cells. You also have the olfactory code hypothesis, and that is the odor is stimulated by a distinct set of receptor cells and its associated receptor proteins. All right, the sense of taste is gustation. Gustation, uh, basically the main organ there would be the taste buds on the tongue. You also have taste receptors. Uh, taste receptors, you have chemoreceptors that are located in the taste buds themselves. Uh, these are sensitive portions. Uh, the sensitive portion is a taste tear, which protrudes out of a taste pore, which is an opening in the taste cell, which makes up the taste bud. So you have a taste pore. Uh, the taste bud is composed of a taste cell within a taste pore, which secretes uh, a taste tear. The chemicals must be dissolved in saliva to be detected and you uh, have it undergo uh, rapid sensory adaptation. So there's the tongue. There are your taste receptors. Here are your taste buds. And then you can see uh, as far as the taste bud, the taste cells, there are supporting cells, there's your taste pore. Here are the taste buds the papilla, and then here's the von Ebner's gland. So taste sensations, uh, most taste buds are posterior near the base of the tongue. The rest of the taste buds of the five primary tastes provide sensations based on their location. So this, uh, uh, as far as sensation for sweetness, that is on the tip of the tongue, uh, stimulated by carbohydrates. You have uh, sour taste buds on the lateral tongue, which are stimulated by acids. You have salt taste buds on the perimeter of your tongue, stimulated by salts, of course. You have bitter taste buds, uh, which are posterior tongue, and those are going to be stimulated by many organic compounds. And then you have umami, which are, are throughout, and those are stimulated by some amino acids. Taste varies from person to person. Uh, some spicy food will activate the pain receptors, and uh, taste receptors do undergo that rapid adaptation. Taste nerve pathways. There are three pathways uh, that the taste nerves take. Uh, you could have cranial nerve 7, which would go to the anterior two-thirds of the tongue. You have cranial nerve 9, which is the posterior one-third of the tongue, and you have cranial nerve 10, which is the walls of the oral cavity and pharynx. So the cranial nerves involved here are 7, 9, and 10. And basically, once the receptors in these areas are stimulated, you have a gustatory impulse that passes to the medulla, and then it will go to the thalamus, and that then is directed to the gustatory cortex, within the parietal lobe for interpretation. So here you can see the projection pathway for taste. So you have facial nerve, cranial nerve 7, the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve 9, and the vagus nerve, cranial nerve 10. The sense of hearing, uh, the organ there is, of course, the ear. So the organ of hearing is the spiral organ or the organ of cordy, which is present in the cochlea of the inner ear. The sensory receptors are called mechanoreceptors. And once these mechanoreceptors are stimulated to threshold, the impulse travels on the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear cranial nerve 8, which leads to the uh, primary auditory cortex, the torp. The, the temporal cortex of the brain, which would be in the cerebrum. So you have uh, three sections of the ear. You have the outer external ear, the middle ear, and the inner internal ear. And if you look here is hearing. So as far as the ear structure, 
you have the outer external ear, you have the auricle, which is the outer ear, or which contains the elastic cartilage, and its overall function is the collection of sound waves. You then have the external acoustic auditory meatus, and the external acoustic auditory anus meatus, sorry, is the ear canal. And that's function, it, that's where you start the vibrations of sound waves, and it directs them toward the tympanic membrane. So that is lined with ceruminous glands, and it carries the sound to the tympanic membrane, which terminates with the tympanic membrane. So once the, the sound reaches there, that ends the external acoustic uh, meatus at that tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane is the start of the middle ear, and its function there is to amplify and concentrate those sound waves. So the tympanic membrane itself vibrates in response to sound waves, and that would be known as your eardrum. So there you can see the uh, breakdown of some of those areas of the ear. There's your tympanic membrane, membrane, the cochlea, the vestibular cochlear nerve, and the tympanic cavity. So the middle ear itself, uh, again, its function is to amplify and concentrate those sound waves. You do have the tympanic membrane or the eardrum, and the tympanic attenuation reflex is when that protective mechanism for hearing mechanoreceptors. So loud noises would cause two muscles associated with the tympanic membrane to contract, and this would decrease the, amplic the amplification effect of the ossicles. In the tympanic cavity, you have uh, an air-filled space behind the eardrum that is going to separate the outer from the inner ear. You also have auditory ossicles, and those auditory ossicles are three tiny bones in the middle ear, and they would be the malleus, incus, and stapes, also known as the hammer, anvil, and stirrup. So those auditory ossicles uh, the malleus is going to be connected to that tympanic membrane. The anvil, or incus, is going to connect the malleus to the stapes, and the stapes, or what you would call the stirrup, is going to connect the incus to the oval window, which is the entrance to the inner ear. So here you can see the malleus, incus, and stapes. You then have the uh, tympanic reflex, and in that, uh, let's look first at the auditory eustachian tube. Which you could see right here. And uh, the auditory tube, or eustachian tube, is a passageway that connects the middle ear to the nasal pharynx of the throat. Basically, that function is to equalize pressure on both sides of the tympanic membrane, which is necessary for proper hearing. So there you can see the, the auditory eustachian tube there, or the auditory tube. There is pictures of the tympanic membrane. All right, ear structure continued. The inner ear. The inner ear, uh, the inner ear consists of complex system of intercommunicating chambers and tubes called the labyrinth. Uh, actually, two labyrinths compose the inner ear. You have the osseous labyrinth, which is the bony canal in the temporal bone, and you have the membranous labyrinth, which is the membrane within the osseous labyrinth. The two types of fluid filled in the spaces in the labyrinths are the paralymph and the paralymph is going to fill the space between the osseous and the membranous labyrinth. You also have the endolymph 
which is going to fill the membranous labyrinth itself. The inner ear also can further be divided into three regions called the cochlea, vestibule, and semicircular canals, each with uh, specific functions. The cochlea or snail-shaped portion of the ear functions in the sense of hearing. The semicircular canals are three rings in different planes that are going to function in dynamic equilibrium. And then the vestibula uh, are the, is the area between the cochlea and the semicircular canals. And that's going to function in static equilibrium. <clears throat> the osseous labyrinth of the cochlea can be divided into two compartments. You have the uh, scala vestibuli, and that is going to be the upper compartment, which extends from the oval window to the apex. And then you have the scala tympani, which is the lower compartment, which is going to extend from the apex to the round window. Both compartments are filled with paralymph. And between the two uh, bony compartments, we also find the membranous labyrinth or the cochlear duct. So uh, you could see that here, the cochlear duct being filled with that endolymph. So here are other uh, histological slides and images. So as far as the cochlea itself, you have the cochlear duct. That's the portion of the membranous labyrinth in the cochlea. You have the vestibular membrane that's going to separate the cochlear duct from the scala vestibuli. You have the basilar membrane, which is going to separate the cochlear duct from the scala tympani. And then you have the tectorial membrane, which is going to extend partially into that cochlear duct. And here you can see uh, pictures of that. So uh, basically, in the inner ear, uh, there are membranes that separate the cochlear duct from the bony compartments. And you can see those there. And also, you have uh, the mechanoreceptors, which are responsible for the sense of hearing that are contained in the spiral organ, or the organ of corti, or corti. And basically, 16,000 hearing receptor cells are located on that uh, basilar membrane. So you have about 16,000 hearing receptor cells located right there. And the receptor cells are called those hair cells. And the hair cells are then covered by tectorial membrane, which lies over them like a little roof. The spiral organ um, is a group of hearing receptor cells or hair cells on the upper surface of that basilar membrane, just below the tectorial membrane. And it's going to have different frequencies of vibrations move different parts of the basilar membrane. And the particular sound frequency cause hairs of receptor cells to bend as they push up against the tectorial membrane. And that will then generate a nerve impulse. So here's histology of the spiral organ. There you can see the spiral organ again. Spiral organ of Corti. The auditory pathways. Uh, you have quite a bit there in the auditory pathways, which is the pathway of sound waves from the outside to the spiral organ. You have the auricle, the external uh, acoustic auditory meatus leading to the tympanic membrane 
the malleus incostapes, oval window, paralymph of the scala vestibuli, the endolymph of the cochlear duct, the hair cells in the spiral organ, and then once these mechanical receptors are stimulated to threshold, a sensory impulse is triggered and then it travels on the cochlear branch of the vestibulocochlear nerve, which would be cranial nerve 8, to the thalamus for direction to the primary auditory cortex of the cerebrum uh, temporal lobes for interpretation. So there you can see the vestibulocochlear nerve. So the summary of the generation of sensory impulse from the ear as just outlined uh, right there, steps of the generation of sensory impulse from the ear. So the ear and equilibrium, you have static equilibrium and dynamic equilibrium. Static equilibrium functions. So we'll continue on with the ear and the sense of equilibrium uh, going over static and dynamic equilibrium and also uh, finish our next lecture with the eye and then lifespan changes with senses.